Okay. So, um, if I've done this right, and my friend to my left <laughs> will, will poke me if I haven't, but all being well, we should be live. So bear with us. Um, this video will remain on the Facebook page. Uh, so this is a very dull introduction for those who want to watch it back. Um, so we'll just introduce ourselves, I guess, and then we'll see if any questions come in. So I'm Deputy Kevin Pamplin. Um, I'm the, the um, Deputy for St. Saviour District Number 1. I am um, first-term politician, as you know, elected in the last election, and I am a non-government states member. So uh, my main role, aside from helping parishioners and all the other bits, is scrutinising health, and I am the... Uh, Vice Chairman of the Health and Social Services Scrutiny Panel. We'll dig into a bit more of that stuff, but that's enough for me. Uh, Senator Steve Power, Assistant Minister at um, both uh, Health and Community Services and Economic Development. And some people may say that's a strange mix, but um, for me, uh, being responsible for mental health um, has been an eye opener and something that um, uh, is something that I've really uh, found a passion for. But I think it also links in with um, the active living side and the well-being side, which I pick up with the economic uh, economic development side through uh, the sports division and um, have a responsibility for sport and active living. So I think there's a synergy there um, and hopefully we might pick that up as the evening goes on. Um, so, yeah, so we're, we're here basically to do a and a This is part of the States uh, of Jersey, the State Assembly's Gress. Uh, democracy week which is a, a great new concept which started pretty much last year and based around the anniversary of the corn riot as i'm sure you've all been finding and if you don't know by now just scroll down on the facebook page and read all about uh, that historic event uh, which led to various changes which got us here today and so now this has become an annual thing where the uh, the assembly the state's greffier will do an outreach project for the whole week um, trying to get across how democracy is set up here in Jersey in modern times. And this week they went to Highlands College to do some workshops, um, which you can read all about on the Facebook page. There was a, another couple of tours of the state's assembly, which has gone down very well, and a virtual uh, tour of the assembly, which I believe there's a couple of spaces left. So this is just the ongoing um, work by the uh, the island's democracy to reach out and the reason for this conversation was because um, it's to show that democracy and the things that matter to all of us everyday folk um, is discussed at a level of this level of politics and um, we will dig into what that uh, means for us but that, that's just sort of an overview of why we're here um, and hopefully and how this will work is on my screen I've got it set up so if you are watching us live we don't know you're there until you'll tell us you're there so if you are there say hello we will wave back <laughs> I guess and we will comment on the page because we have that ability so if you are watching let us know that you're there and also ask us any questions about anything to do with mental health um, I think it's fair to say we are not professional um, experts we are politicians we have wealth of experience and knowledge and stuff but obviously the most important thing to say if you are watching this and you need help there is there is many many um, 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 services available to you but we'll do our best at our level so I hope that's covered all bases so we'll let a few questions come in let's see if you want to say anything else uh, yeah I mean um, in terms of democracy I think you can't get anything better than, than having some face-to-face -face contact with the public we don't do it often enough um, people say it's, it must be awful going into election because you have to, you know, you're, you're going to be put on the spot. But actually, that's what we're there to do. We're there to answer questions and we're there to engage um, with the public. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes people ask you really difficult questions on subjects where maybe an area where you've got responsibility hasn't performed particularly well. And, and sometimes that's not easy. But I think the important thing is that we can be open, that we can be contactable and, and have the opportunity, opportunity to engage. Um, I like to think both of us are fairly uh, open in regards to um, being, able to, uh, being able to contact us. Um, you know, I think we're fairly easy to get hold of. Um, uh, but it is important that the public do get an opportunity to, to speak to us. Uh, and I'm sure on this particular subject, there's going to be a lot of uh, really interesting questions. So it's, a, it's an area where 
you know, uh, I know Kevin when he first got elected was was keen to, to make an impact, and the um, the review that he scrutiny panel did, did certainly did that. And I think it woke woke us up to um, uh, a few shortcomings, or, uh, well, many shortcomings within uh, within uh, adult mental health services. Um, but moving on from that, I, you know, I think we've 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 tried to work hard. I think as a as a government, as a health department, to try to Im improve on that. Um, but a lot of that has been around engagement with the public, um, and that's always need and that needs to be part of all our decision making. We talk about lived experience um, and those that have been through um, difficult times, and people with lived experience do need to um, to be part of uh, the you know, service provision changes in service provision uh, and how we look at providing services in the future that type of co-production with people with experience is really important and i'm sure that may well come up in tonight's um, discussion as well yeah and, and i think the, the thing is everybody has their way into politics and politics is is for everybody it affects all of our lives the decisions that's made in this assembly above our heads affect all of our lives uh, and so what we have to get better at is connecting that process up and what it means and make it more accessible for everybody. so when the election comes everybody who they feel that they've got a cause and they've got a voice and they've got a reason should be enabled to stand and represent their island or what they feel very passionate about and go on that journey whether you get elected we'll see but this is a very important week and we're, we're just happy to be here and, and talk about subject matter that matters, we know, to a lot of people. Um, and we'll dig into that work as we go. So um, we have got some comments. Let's just lean over. Hello, Claire. Good to see you. Um, hope you're well. Uh, Kevin's with us. Kevin, it's good to see you. Good name, obviously. Hmm. Uh, Kevin says, what do you think will be the effects on people's mental health from the lockdown? Um, and all of that's happened this year. And just so we're thinking about that, we'll just say hello to Dave. Hello, Dave. Hello, Samantha. Um, Andy's here. Hello, Andy. Hi, Andy. Uh, Ronan's here. Uh, Mr. Patrick. Hello. Hi, Paul. Yeah. And uh, Jane. So that great. So if you're just joining us, remember we won't know you're watching unless you say hello to us. So please just type a hello and if you've got a question. Um, but we'll start as we uh, Kevin's got us off and going. So the effects of people's mental health from lockdown. Um, there is going to be effects. Um, I think there's already been uh, evidence, I think, from uh, other parts of the country and I think other parts of the world that um, uh, being locked down, um, being isolated for periods of time is going to have effect on um, anybody's mental health. It doesn't matter how strong you are. Uh, we're beginning to see it a little bit here. I'm not, uh, I don't think we've been inundated with um, people suffering from mental health illness as such, but I think in terms of mental health issues, I think um, there's been a rise in those that have had um, uh, various issues to, to do with, um, be it depression, anxiety, uh, stress from being laid off work, all the, you know, potentially losing your home, all those type of issues, which have caused people a lot of anxiety and a lot of worry um, during the period. And those, those, those issues are just beginning to come through now. Another issue, I think, which uh, Jersey's been historically uh, poor with is, is alcohol abuse and I think that's another area I think where uh, numbers have been, uh, been rising through the alcohol and drug service um, and that's, that's, that's got a lot of detrimental effect not just for the individual but for families and potentially for young people as well and, and children so um, there are areas I think where um, we do need, to, um, we need, do need to, to help and assist where we can and we're starting to put more resource into that um, but in terms of uh, what that's going to look like and how serious it's been, I think it's going to take a few months before we really understand the effect of COVID. And, and of course, we're not out of the woods yet. We've still got the winter to get through. Um, uh, and it could yet be difficult for, for, uh, for many families and islanders. So um, uh, there will be effects. Um, how bad they are, um, we haven't really seen yet. Um, not, not numbers in terms of numbers through the door in adult mental health services or, or CAMS, children's mental health services. But like I say, we're beginning to see, a, we're beginning to see a, a, a rise in cases from all sorts of, for all sorts of reasons. Um, and some of them are, uh, a lot of it's connected about daily life and the issues of dealing with daily life. Mm. Yeah, and I think, it, I think what Stu just said is a really important point that so much has happened in this year. I mean, you think about it, 
um, when we all look back at 2020, we all see the, the stories of how much has happened across the world, that I don't, as human beings, we need time to process things. Sometimes you don't get that luxury um, and that's where we always talk about self-care and well-being and making sure you're giving yourself time to process because it's really important otherwise you get overwhelmed and I think we all went on a collective journey uh, uh, weirdly separated but collectively together so we all have shared stories shared experiences shared emotions and I think that's going to be really important going forward that as a community we, we keep looking and listening out for each other and we'll do our part by trying to reassure and, and get services to, to a level that they're available and should be. But I think as an island, as all of us, we've all been through this together. I mean, how many times have we all, you, you've seen somebody you haven't seen for a while and said, hey, how was your lockdown? And so we all have a collective responsibility to, to make sure we're listening. And how many times do we often say in mental health, you know, you just don't know what battle anybody's going through. So there's going to be there's going to be a lot of things to process. We've got through it. Um, it was tough, but there are resources in place. And the island, in terms of where it was two years ago, thank goodness we, we got to work straight away on some level, levels of this because there are good services out there. Mm -hmm. Listening Lounge have been extraordinary um, with their setup and putting that in place. All the charities, again, stepping up to the table and, and all the other services that are out there. But I just think also there's a willingness from businesses and, and, and everybody to just, they get it now. They get it. The, the lifting of the stigma is, it, we get it. But we've all gone through something we never saw coming so we all now have to like a good athlete as well as you train up for something you do the event you don't just leave it you then sort of downtrack we have to do that process now yeah. we have to make sure we continue talking through the experiences that's going to be really important but the, 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 there's been a lot of negative aspects of, of, of covid um the effect it has on people's lives but from, from a service point of view um there's been a dramatic change to the way we had to deliver services through COVID, clearly with no face-to-face -face contact. That, that was really difficult. But I think there's some positives that have come out of that. I think with um, uh, setting up a crisis team, I think, with, uh, and setting up a home treatment team as well, that, that were dealing with people that were coming out of the service and making sure they had support when they were leaving the service to go back into to, to some sort of normal life. Um, those type of services we need to carry on doing and will be part of future service delivery. So some of the some of the ways that we've delivered the service differently will be integrated into the new service as we move forward. Um, so there has been some positives, but clearly, um, you know, when, an, when our island goes through something like this, um, uh, there are a lot of people that suffer through this. I do feel for those that have been isolated. Uh, there's certainly a lot of our uh, more senior uh, islanders that have been that have had to isolate for long periods of time and some of our more, vul more vulnerable islanders as well. And I do feel for them and I've been pressing all the way through this to make sure that they get, they get the right support that they need. Um, have they? Um, uh, I'm not sure they have. Um, I think we've done the best we can, but I think if there's going to be any longevity in terms of um, isolating people, they do need the right support. All sorts of support. It's not just around mental health support. It's physical support as well, making sure that they can live day by day. Um, and certainly with our elderly people that are living on their own, making sure that they feel supported and make sure that they don't feel lonely. Uh, there's nothing worse, I think, than living, um, you know, I, 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 unfortunately with my role as a council, I met a, a lot of our elderly citizens. Some of them, unfortunately, do lead quite lonely lives. Some of them want to do that. Some of them are very independent. But that's all, there's also some dangers to that as well. And I think identifying those and make sure they get the support is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and remember, if you're just tuning in, I'm going to do a lot of this. It's going to feel very familiar to an old job I used to do. But if you've just tuned in, uh, please say hello. Don't know that you're there. That's really important. And please just ask us a question, uh, whatever it is. Obviously, with tonight, we're talking about mental health. But um, please just type a question in. Uh, Mr. Burgess is there. I've heard of him. Uh, hello, Kirsty. Uh, good to see you. Nicola, thank you for your email. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, hello, Dave. Amanda's there and Kevin's got another question, but one that came in earlier, which yep. Nick Nicola's referred to there, um, it's quite simply because of the current news, yep. but worried about uh, 
my son's mental health following lockdown and anxiety about returning to school and equally now the situation with university. So um, I know you just, you just mentioned CAMS there as well, but this is a big subject today. Isn't it? It's huge. It's a huge subject. Um, uh, I think from a student point of view, um, uh, it, it is difficult. I mean, a lot of our students have gone back to university expecting to go back to some sort of normal university life to find that they've been locked down. Uh, without the ability to interact with students. Um, in terms of mental health, um, there are, I mean, you've only got to Google what services are available, and I think, you, you know, that there are services available within the university themselves as counsellors within, the, within the universities. I'm sure they're going to be inundated. Um, student unions, I know, help. Um, there's online support through, uh, through Mind uh, UK. And, a, and another charity called SANE, not one I've heard of before, but probably one that Kevin yeah. has. So I think there's both online support and help within the universities for, uh, for, for, for young people going back. But to be, be, but to be serious, I mean, if it is a serious issue. Um, as we would say here, you know, if you've really got a problem, then you need to go and see a GP and I think be referred on from that, even if you're away um, uh, in the UK or in, in, in England, I think you, you, you need to identify the fact that you've got a problem early on and, and try to get the, tr the best possible treatment you can. A lot of the, the issues will be around anxiety, worry about, um, you know, go, some, for, for many going to university for the first time, then finding that, that it's, been, uh, it's been a really negative experience of trying to cope with that. But there is support there. Um, uh, and like I say, there's online support as well. I'll let Kevin deal with the schools one because I think um, uh, I've had my bit. You have. <laughs> Thank you, mate. No, I think there's two parts to it. Firstly, I, I, I'm a parent. I'm a young parent, even though I don't look. I've aged in two years. <laughs> don't know what happened. I, I was in my early forties. But um, so I've got two children, as everybody knows. Um, my daughter Beatrice, who's just starting secondary school. And at the same time, her older brother, who's just going to university, both big transitional moments in their lives. And, um, you know, they are taking it. And we got to remember this, that children are very resilient. It's, a, it's about the environment that you put around them. And they're affected by the worries and the anxiety around them as well. So it's a two way process. And I learn much from them, too, than I do with my own anxieties for, about them. So come constant communication. Interestingly for us as a unit, as a family, it, it's made us better as, I don't know if you found this as well, but the three of us have suddenly communicated much better. I mean, we were already, but we're suddenly talking about stuff more openly and being there for the three of us. I mean, technology is amazing. The three of us, if, if B's got a problem, she can FaceTime me, we can bring her brother in and we're all there talking to each other. So I think that's really important. And uh, so she's doing well at school. She knows where support is. Um, and the schools are doing a much better job of providing counsellors. So yeah. it, look at that as well. Uh, talk to the schools, secondary and primary year. They're doing much better than the uh, previous years. And then in terms of university, have those conversations. Now, me and my son, we've had a chat about how we want to go about it. He's moving in October and I'm going to go. I'm going to be there. And then he wants me out of the way, which is quite right but we're putting things in place. So just put things in place and just check in. But it, it's a careful balance because you don't want to do too much because you want to let them have that independence, but they've got to know the securities around them. But um, so, and, and at a political level, um, already we, I've been engaged by parishioners today and other people. Um, the education department put out a statement today, there's support being put in place. I think this is a subject that's going to be raised in the assembly next week, no doubt, during question time. So we will continue to put those and make it more obvious, but support will be there. But I think from, from a personal point of view, um, I think my youngest, she, she bounced through the whole process of COVID because she's young enough to enjoy a bit of not being in school structure, but equally then recognise she missed it. She wanted to go back to school. So we're putting boundaries in place and supporting her. And then uh, interestingly, and I, he's probably watching this, like putting his head in his hands, but he, uh, my eldest found it more troubling at 18, but we've got there through it. So uh, good questions, and but we will continue to push the, at a political level, but um, and at a school level too. I'll well, just add to that, children's mental health has, uh, has been through a review. There's a business case going in at the moment for, for more investment into, uh, into, into children's mental health services, but also includes more support within schools, 
trying to get the waiting list down for people that, uh, for, for young people that have, um, that have got issues, because I know the waiting list has been too long, and we need to get that down to, to a reasonable level. But there is investment in, in it. In terms of teenagers, we've got the Youth Inquiry Service, which do an absolutely incredible job, um, are, are based up in Columbia. Um, so anybody that's of that age, you know, if you've got an issue or uh, something that you need to talk to somebody about, go and use the Youth Inquiry Service. It's a fantastic service. Um, uh, and we'll provide you with the support. And that, that support also goes, uh, is also available in a lot of the youth clubs as well. We forget sometimes the amount of um, engagement that the youth clubs have with young people and the support that they give. So there is support out there, but it needs to be better and there is going to be more investment in those services. A few more questions coming in. Um, Dave's talked about um, um, provision during the pandemic. We'll get back to that. I'm just, make, I'm just scrolling down now because all the questions are coming in uh, and what capacity for any increase in service demands are in place uh, staffing levels um, and there's a couple more questions here so let's just deal with that so let's let's deal with so just a reminder for those who are watching just so we are very friendly and we're very with but this is politics I know that's not the the, the, the angle that's uh, sells newspapers, but we work constructively together. We don't have party politics here. We're, we, there is a party yet. yet. That may happen. <laughs> Let's not get into that one tonight. Um, so at the moment, we're sat as independent uh, politicians, certainly how I work. So I scrutinise what the government put forward, and obviously the Senator is the, the Assistant Minister of Responsibility. And just a reminder, um, Steve mentioned earlier, we did this our scrutiny panel, which we started in 2018, it was the assessment of mental health services. In this, we had recommendations which we put to the government. The government accepted all of them, bar one. One of those was to create uh, an area uh, in political responsibility, which we were then thrilled was the senator. He's less thrilled because he gets to put up with me and <laughs> badgering him all the time and asking questions. But I'm here to basically uh, to do that job is to ask questions of probe and questions like that are coming up here about provision. That's exactly what I did during COVID. Do you want to pick up the Jersey Talk and Therapy? One? Yeah, it's so it's an interesting one. Yeah, because that was something we did raise during the pandemic. It was certainly one of my yeah. concerns, and you can talk us through that. Um, we've had a question from Dave. It says, during the pandemic, um, all mental health provision was withdrawn. Hang on, that's not the one. There was another one. Oh yes, there we are from Kevin. What is your opinion of Jersey Talk and Therapy is closed to the public at the beginning of lockdown with only letter to some? Um, that's clearly uh, not something that we wanted to do. Um, you know, we, we would have preferred to have kept Jersey Talk and Therapy open all the way through that um, because people wanted face-to-face -face contact. Um, they need face-to-face -face contact with some of the issues that they had. Unfortunately, uh, COVID didn't allow that. Um, a lot of people Everybody was supposed to be sent a letter. That's no, no excuse about that. Everybody should have been contacted. Some clearly were missed. And I think the service has taken some time to get back to a point where they re-engage with those people. Um, but I have asked uh, over the last couple of days to get an update on Jersey Talk and Therapies, just to see where we are with them, because I know Kevin raised it the other, the other day. Um, they are open for business as usual, uh, and they've started to take self-referrals on the phone or online. So we're starting to get that re-engagement with the public. Um, they're currently offering face-to-face -face phone and online video support and interventions, which I think is a, is a, is a move forward. Face-to-face um, -face is still going to be difficult for some, but I think um, using the technology we've got for some people, it won't work for some, but for some actually having that contact will be really important. What I can say is in, in August, we had 645 appointments provided. So I think you can see the services getting back up to the sort of levels that we were before. Um, and more importantly, um, we've got no waiting list for first line treatment. That's the low, low intensity uh, support, which is a step two. There, are, there is a waiting list for step three. That we're hoping to work through and get down to uh, as near as we can to zero by Christmas. Um, so the service is back up and running. We've got all our staff back. Um, it's been a difficult period. I, I'm not going to make excuses. You know, I, you know, I would have preferred to get the, back, the, the service back quicker than we have. but. We're, we're getting there. The listening lounge, as Kevin has said, has picked up some of the slack during that period. But uh, when you're getting into areas where um, more detailed support uh, and more expertise is required, 
Um, it's, it's been difficult to provide that at times, uh, and I can only apologise for that. But um, we're getting to the point now where people are getting the, the support they need in a timely manner, um, and, and we need to carry that on. And I, I think what I'd add to that is what I keep saying uh, repeatedly is, in a moment of crisis, it exposes everything. It exposes the good stuff, the bad stuff, leaders, non-leaders, uh, good things, bad things, whatever. And I think what it exposed, the pandemic exposed in many ways, is how unprepared a lot of the world was for a pandemic across the world, and not naming countries, <coughs> America. But the, every, every government around the world was challenged. And I think we'd all be, well, everybody said it, there wasn't a specific respiratory SARS type a pandemic. There was a flu one, which is where we started from, but as quickly as the unknown element of the pandemic took hold, mm. decisions had to be made, and that regrettably left its services exposed. And mental health was one of those. I mean, it was the problem. I think the other thing with Jersey Talk and Therapies, one of the benefits, I think, is, is, is being, we've been able to do a review of all the cases because yeah. we've had time to do that. There were, there were clearly some people that were in the, in the service that, um, that didn't need help or, or moved away from needing help. But there were others actually that, that um, didn't need mental health support. It was, there was other issues that they'd phoned Jersey Talk and Therapies up about that could have been dealt with through other services. Uh, and li listening lounge just found that as well. You know, a lot of these things that they've had to deal with in terms of people having anxiety or worries have been around all sorts of areas. It could have been, it, some of them have been around living conditions. Um, uh, you know, some of it's been around marriage breakup, alcohol abuse, all sorts of things, some of which needed specific support um, and not always through uh, something like Jersey Talking Therapy. So it did give us a chance to review it, um, which is why I think we're getting the service back on track and bringing the waiting list right down, which I think is, po is, a, po is a positive. And, and I think that's one we'll just keep reviewing and, and, and obviously that's part of our role in scrutiny is to dig into all of this, um, which I'm sure the Senator is always pleased to hear. <laughs> um, Andy uh, asked a question. This is capacity for any increase in service demands in place, are staffing levels a concern? I think they're a concern always, aren't they? I mean, that's the big, yeah, big challenge. Yeah, Andy, I, I mean, I, again, you know, I'm not going to read from a document. You wouldn't, you wouldn't expect me to do that. But, you know, I've, I've, I asked all the questions around staffing levels, both uh, within our inpatient service, our community service, you know, and there are, there are difficulties recruiting staff. We've known that all the way through. But we are beginning to get there. We're, we're even in the senior post, you know, some, you know, in terms of psychology, we are beginning to re recruit, recruit people. We are people getting people into the service. Um, it, it, it's difficult. You know, we're in a market where you know we've got other jurisdictions that are looking for highly qualified staff as well. And that's not meant as an excuse. It's just it's just difficult to recruit people. But we're getting there. I think the services uh, is beginning to recover from that. Our inpatient services. I know at Orchard House, which you'll you'll, you'll be aware of. You know, we have got I think a, a much a vastly improved service there. Good leadership. Um, I think with a good team in there, and that's taken a little bit of time to build. So, um, you know, for me, it's been uh, it's been a, it's been a difficult period. I've always put pressure on wanting to see success or or, or, or see improvement quickly, but um, you know, we've got to realise we're in a, we're in a we're in a market where um, there are a lot of people looking for these this expertise. What we've got to try to do though, as well, is re retain our staff. We've not been very that at times we've put them under too much pressure um, and I think now I think the feedback from uh, from staff and the way we interact with staff and, and, and engage with them I think it's made it up, uh, in terms of the morale of the staff it's improved greatly um, we've had independent um, people come into Orchard House to see that that's improved that the morale's improved greatly with staff and that's beginning to have a knock-on effect with the with, uh, with our clients as well, is you know, they feel welcoming, they find the service better, and they find the, uh, the results and the outcomes uh, much better for themselves as well. So, um, but you're right, it's not easy, but we will, you know, we are putting a lot of pressure on trying to make improvements as quickly as we can. And then to bring us back into the political area, because that's all we can talk to, because we're obviously not experts, we're politicians. Um, the point was, we all knew that there were problems within mental health services. We all, as outsiders, as I was a couple of years ago, working in the charity uh, world myself and having friends and family go through troubling times, is um, something was not right. And equally, there was a lot of talk over the last few years. Things were going to happen and they were happening. And, and um, so to be able to come in and, and go, right, 
this is going to be my main focus and say, what, why is there a store? Why isn't there a mental health service? And to be able to get straight into that and bring that forward is what's been the point of this. Because my big um, issue that I had, well, many, is there wasn't the accountability in previous assemblies. And it's no disrespect to Senator, and, and he's, been a, he's seen it himself, that if you say you're going to do something, then equally as important is that other politicians stand up and said, Minister, you said this, where's this? And to keep that pressure on. It comes from the outside because campaigners, and you're all here tonight because you're passionate about the subject and the charities are, everybody out there, but I don't believe there's been enough people supporting around people who think like this. So to be able to come in, and this is where, again, politics does matter. And if you are thinking about standing for election, this is the more people come together and want to work constructively can pick at these answers enough is enough this has been going on for too long and and that's what drives change and i, I firmly believe that and we've you know this is going to take years but at least we're going to not we're not going to give up that momentum and hopefully alongside the things that steve's mentioned we increase these problems and provide um, a service that people want to come and work for in a building that is fit for purpose in, in an island that does look out for families and all types. And, and that's what we're all striving for. So hopefully that helps. Um, Can we just deal with that question from Juliet around yep. uh, continuity of staff and contractors? Um, I think the intention now within mental health services is, is to have uh, full-term employees, long-term staff, try to move away from using bank staff too much. It's, it's been difficult because, like I say, uh, trying to recruit staff has been difficult over, the, over the, I think, the last couple of years. But I think we are now to a point where we're, not only are we retaining staff, we're taking, taking staff on. Some of the bank staff that we were using um, have now come on board and are actually working within the service. So I think that, that's a good thing because it, it, the, 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 uh, the clients, the people that we are treating, see the same faces on a regular basis, not new people coming in and out. And that's really important in a recovery. Um, so I think we're getting there. Um, in terms of Gail's question around um, 330 budgeted staff and only 253, I can't answer that because I don't, because I, I'd have to check. Um, we certainly are, we certainly haven't got 47. Well, we certainly haven't got 87 unfilled roles within within mental health. I've only got responsibility for adult mental health, so I can't really talk about uh, children's mental health in, in terms of level of. Uh, vacancies. We do have vacancies, but it's not sort of to the level that you're talking about. Service has been um, has been um, uh, redesigned over that period of time, um, but I, we haven't got that many uh, jobs up for grabs, put it that way. Um, so I can't really answer that. I'll, I'll, but I will look into it. Good questions, though, and, and keep them coming in again if you're just tuning in. Uh, please keep keep the questions coming and we'll answer as many as we can. Um, Amanda said, I'm trained in psychotherapy, but practice at the moment in a form of therapy. I'm currently, that's great. And I think what we're discovering more so because of technology is, but there's, there's a lot of people who want to come forward and help. So please keep sharing resources. Amanda, that's really helpful. Um, Kevin's got another question there. Uh, we're bringing down the stigma around mental health. What ray of hope do you both envisage for the future of mental health uh, of HM? I think that's supposed to be MH, I presume. Yeah, we'll go with that. Um, st uh, the stigma, I mean, we keep, we keep talking around it. Parity of esteem is something that we regularly, the phrase we regularly use. I think it, if, if you'd have asked the public three or four years ago what parity of esteem meant, they wouldn't have had a clue. I think people out on the street now are beginning to understand what that means, that we need to treat mental health with the same dignity uh, and priority that we treat physical health, which is why and I'm not going to get on the, onto the argument about where the hospital should be or where, what the hospital sh should or shouldn't be, but we do need to co-locate the hospital. Mental health needs to be part of the physical environment of the hospital moving forward. Um, the new uh, facility at Clinic Pennell is only a short-term fix. Uh, we, we do need to co-locate that. But the stigma around mental health, I think, has been improved by all sorts of things. I mean, some of the high-profile figures that have come and admitted that they've had problems. There was an excellent documentary last night. It wasn't, well, it was around mental health. The bulimia is a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. uh, with with um, uh, Andrew Flintoff, Freddie Flintoff, talking about his problems with, with bulimia. And I think the more people that do that, the more people will be more open to, to talking about some of the issues that they've had personally. And that reduces the stigma. Um, people, you know, I, I have discussions now with male friends 
that I wouldn't have had discussions about five years ago. Um, not because of doing the job I'm doing now, but just purely, I think, we're beginning to realise actually, you know, we're not all toughies. We, we, you, know, we, you know, there's a lot of men out there that struggle. Um, yeah. And, and we have to cope with it and we have to deal with it and we have to be open about it. So I think the more that we talk about it openly and the more people like Flintoff and people like that, uh, David Williams, all those type of people talk about some the issues that they've had, the easier it is for us to talk about. And I guess for us as well as politicians, because, you know, politicians quite rightly come under a lot of stick. I mean, that's the point. And, and you know, but at least we're sat here as two elected politicians by you uh, talking about an everyday subject and I guess the most other important part of this is, is is the equality issue because mental health affects one in four, four people as we know that's the statistic but in reality um, like Covid um, it could be any one of us it doesn't matter what your background is doesn't matter how uh, how much money you have what job you do what level in society you have we will all have some connection and some uh, battle, be it on whatever level. And there is a distinction, of course, between mental health and mental illness. That's important to remember. But the, the pandemic show all of us is that, yes, equally, we all could have been affected, but who were affected more? They were the less of. The people that we need to get to, the people who are out in society, who are struggling, who can't for whatever reason, people who are suffering in silence, people who are trapped within their own homes or in relationships or in addiction, people who are struggling because they can't pay the bills, single parents, you name it. And, and let's also be frank about this, during the pandemic, the people who really stepped up were all the, the first responders, people working in shops, our teachers, um, everyday folk who uh, who put their own lives and their own livelihoods ahead of everybody else and and, and in some areas and certainly parts of the united kingdom around the world those people on the front lines are the cleaners and, and shop workers and stuff were putting themselves in the line of getting an, an, an illness so we have to make sure that mental health support is accessible for everybody and you know we could sit here we we we, we know we're in privileged positions uh, it's not the world most well paid job in the world so i can testify that with two children but i don't do but this it's job not the for worst money. paid job in the it's world it's not the worst paid either but it's not about money but i know there are people out there who 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 are really struggling yeah, and there are that for me there is are. what mental health should be about that we can make sure that people whoever they are and especially those who who need it get it and that's our biggest challenge is how do we get our mental health service, not just to the standard where it should be, because that was the whole point of me um, coming in here and wanting to do this, but how it can access everybody, and especially those who are struggling. Access to the service is, is absolutely key. Um, we've had a crisis team all the way through COVID, and that crisis team is, is, is carry on working. What we need, and the intention is to have a 24-hour crisis line. Um, that's something that we haven't had here. Um, and that's something that is is uh, very much in our thoughts at the current time, and as we as, as we're planning to move forward. Um, I just saw something from Nicola around um, first time students, uh, and that, that's a good point. I think we answered probably the question around if you were already there. If, if you were a first time student, um, and what access, you, what help you could access from here. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure uh, what that would be, whether it would be a former tutor or, or some support that you've currently had on Ireland and, and, and tap into that, or if necessary, your own GP here. Um, but I, uh, you know, I, I, all, I can, all I can say is what I've read is that um, services within the universities are, are well developed, um, and I'm sure they will have, uh, you're right about them being inundated, but I'm sure they'll be, um, looking to try to help those that are most in need and clearly if you're if you're a first time student um you are going to be the most vulnerable uh, and i'm sure that the, you know the services will be targeted for those that are most vulnerable within the universities mm. um some questions are linking up here in terms of political change and i guess this is um i mean dave's written one here it, it, it's, a, it's a good point um because He's asking, and the, the golden question is, we talk about it, but meaningful change, lasting change. And I, I, I don't know how you feel talking about this, but I mean, he's talked about a recent vote that's gone through the Assembly, because I think it's a very key problem on this island, and that is accommodation. 
Um, we are an island at the end of the day. It, it, it's a problem of, of its island's own making. It should have been resolved ages ago. Um, but we don't have enough um, good, decent standard of living to go around for people, no matter where you are in society, but especially those people who are coming to work on this island. And if we are trying to attract good people dedicated to delivering exceptional mental health care in our health service, we need to be able to provide them health and shelter but not at the cost of providing that health and shelter. Yeah. And it's a big problem, which I think still we're struggling with politically. That's my own view. Accommodation is extremely expensive here. It doesn't matter whether you're looking to buy or whether you're looking to rent. It is, it is horrendous to, 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 to get first foot on the ladder. I'm, I've had it with my own children, how difficult it's been compared with when I was a, when I was a youngster. And... When I look back now, uh, the opportunities that there were to buy and rent at that time, it's just changed uh, unbelievably over that, over that period of, of, of my lifetime. And, and we've got to get back to a point where we build homes. Uh, one is we build homes for a life, for life so that people, when they buy a home, it's not a commodity. It's something that they're looking to buy and live in and bring the family up in. Uh, and I think the other one is I think we probably need to change the aspirations of young people around what what, what a home may be, and it may, may for some have to be, or may have to start off being um, uh, a flat or uh, an apartment rather than going straight into a house, and then you you work your way you work your way up, or you work to a you know you, you, over over a few years you work to a point where you can buy a house. And I think the aspirations need to be lowered a little bit, um, but they need to be affordable. Um, I, you know, I've, I've questioned the buy-to-let market. We both, I think, we both have concerns around the amount of property that's being bought that's being bought to purely let out as, as a profit. Um, it's not so much; it's a bad thing. It's just I think the amount of it that is now that people are looking to make a profit off. I think it has uh, forced rents up um, to a degree where um, it, 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 for many it's, un, it's unaffordable. So I think there are a lot of issues that we need to deal with within the, within the housing market um, that uh, we're going to have to take a different approach on. I think the register, um, knowing who owns what is important. Um, we know there are people that hide behind uh, chair transport and hide behind companies. And for me, that, that is, is something that we need to change. We need to know, know who owns the property. Uh, and if we're not happy with the way that ownership works, we can change it. But we need to know who owns it to start. Yeah, and because this all links up, and the, the one area we all come back to is how interlinked the effects of a decision is on your mental health. And that could be your employment, your 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 home, um, and your livelihood. And then, of course, you add in other elements of living on an island, uh, your personal life, and all that sort of stuff. They all add up. And again, this is where politics is key, and I think this is where the link has been lost. And again, I'm speaking as myself over many many years is the disconnect this is something we talk about the disconnect between politics and everyday folk because we all live and breathe and share the same island we all have the same issues but in different ways but we can feel it out there and some of us are in the ability i was in the ability to go do you know what i'm gonna throw my hat into the ring so i'm hoping that these sorts of conversations that people because if we get that type of representation and we can link it up better and we wouldn't have to have conversations in the assembly where we're asking simple questions about these sort of things but it is important so this is why it's good that you're asking it and dave's got another good question here about the impact on waiting lists is, is medical care and the cost of care and yeah. i guess that's something we're looking at at the moment with the care model but that's a big issue as well. it, it, it it is it is a big issue but um you know, we do need to get the waiting times down. We know they're not good, they're not good enough in children's mental health and they're certainly not good enough at adult, adult mental health either. But, you know, that's something that we're working on. I think there's been no lack of commitment from government and states members around um, investment. You know, every time we've talked about it in the states, that people want to support uh, mental health and want to support improvement in mental health. So uh, there is investment there, both in buildings and it's not just about buildings, it's about what goes in the buildings and the services you offer. But there is certainly investment um, being put into the services and we need to make sure that we get uh, that we uh, we get the most for the money we put in. We, we you know, People deserve to have a better service uh, and we are gonna try to provide that. 
Um, I'm going to move it a little bit to chatty benches. I like chatty oh, benches. Oh, this is great. Yeah, this is great. Um, they're a great idea. I mean, my idea of a chatty bench through through COVID was my little scrim, swimming group. We, we'd meet through COVID and we we used to go down, grab a coffee at the from the shop down in St. Bellard's Bay and we'd take a coffee and we'd go and have a chat. And we'd talk about all sorts of things that we normally wouldn't talk about. Um, and that from, that's been an outlet for all of us. And I'm sure it's been the same for a lot of other people that form little bubbles or little groups um, that have helped to talk their way through out of it. So I'm all for chatty benches or anything that gets people to talk to each other. Um, there's a lot more groups now I'm seeing of, of men actually supporting each other. And it's not just about men, it's men and women, but it's certainly men beginning to meet up and do little things together that they might not, especially walking. I know of half a dozen people that I know that have formed a little walking group and go, uh, and there's actually no alcohol involved with it, which is surprising knowing them. But they go for a walk, they go for a coffee, and they just talk about simple things in life. Uh, and they do talk about their grandchildren, all the things that are really important to them in, in their lives. Would they have done that 10 or 15 years ago? Probably not. So uh, I'm a big supporter of Chatty Ventures. And... Um, you mentioned the youth and community centre. Well, we've already mentioned youth centres. They are absolutely vital. And, yeah. um, do we need one north of St Helly? Absolutely, we do. We all support. We were both supportive of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And I think because I, again, it comes from again lived experience of living in the side. When I was a kid, I went to Seaton Youth Centre. Yeah. I went to Aquila, um, and I remember Sounds Workshop. And those places in my growing up, I grew up in Ancourt. I grew up in St Helia. I went to Jambridge School. I went to Dotray. Those places were fundamental in my my allowance to, to become the person I am today. I it would have been invaluable without them. And it is quite sad. Where a lot of people get sad about where's Pluto's playtime, where's Bellevue, where's fantastic tropical gardens. I think about where are all the things that helped me as a young man. And yes, the youth service has been centralised. I'm not knocking it. It's excellent what they what they do, but just. The thing about mental health, and we had it at the charity as well, you can't tell people to come and get something. They have to do it on their own. You have to make it available, and you have to make it as open as possible so they'll make that first step. And that's where these benches are great, because they're just there. They're just there if they need, and people could sit on them and meet. And I think the more open we are as a society, you know, in a staff room, it suddenly became more open, or people started giving wellness breaks, or people just suddenly, I mean, the Zoom classes where people are doing yeah. movie quiz and stuff, but people are starting, I think, to unlock it and be brave enough to go, let's do that. You can't make people do it, but all we can do is open it up and put these things out. But you've got to provide opportunity, yep. and it doesn't matter where it is, uh, and I'm going to, what, one example would be around Orchard House, and I think um, the importance of occupational therapy and providing opportunities for people to do, to keep, keep, their, keep themselves um, busy during the time that they're there, giving them things that, uh, that can refocus them uh, and, and make them well again. Um, so, you know, it is right. We do need to provide opportunity in all walks of life. Um, the most important one, well, one of the most important ones for me is certainly around young people and providing them with, you know, I've, I've, already, I've got an interest in sport. Um, I've, I've always said there's a sport for everybody. It doesn't matter. When you're young, you need to have the opportunity to try loads of different things. Um, for some, it'll be culture and arts. For other, it'll be sport. For others, it'll be on orienteering or something out, something you know, something different. But I think the more opportunities we offer for people, uh, I think the, the and they've got something to focus on. The less chance there is that they're going to um, uh, not have that that opportunity to relax and refocus their mind, and probably not get, get themselves in a bad place. For me, it was sport. For Kevin, I suppose, you know, I don't know what your release was. For me, it's always been sport. If I felt a bit down, you know, I'd go for a run or I'd go play football or I'd go do something. Yeah. Um, but everybody's different, and I think you've got to provide that opportunity. But just um, having that youth club when I was at Seaton, yeah. you could turn up at youth club at Seaton and you could play five side football, or you just go and sit in the, in the cafe, or you could just do something. It doesn't matter, but the space was there for you to go in and it was available, and there was no questions, there was no. Qualms, you you were just given space to, to do what you needed at that time because as growing up you don't know what you need one day you want something next day you know other but that's also got to exist for people in the workplace as well yeah. because the pressures you know I think COVID is even even uh, focused people you know, the workplace is, is going to get much tougher yeah. I think people are going to be uh, employees are going to be much 
uh, much more focused on productivity and making sure they get the most of their employees. That's probably going to be more pressure on employees. Um, we've got to persuade and educate our employers to really think about their employees, look after them from a mental health angle. If somebody walks in with a broken arm, you see it. If somebody walks in with a broken head, they don't know about that. And I think making sure that you look after your, so your, your staff and making sure that they're well supported, mental health first aid, is all the sort of things that we talk about. Um, and I'm hoping we're not paying lip service to because it's important that you know having me mental health first aid is within the workplace that they do what they say that, that they should be doing and making sure that this that staff are looked after and ask and people are asking the right questions. And that, and, and that comes from the, from all of us as well, leading by example, which is why I'm such a pain in the butt to the government because the, I think that's the biggest example that needs to be set. There's a question coming about elderly. We've talked a lot about young people. Um, there's a question come out about specifically our older generation and I think it's probably a good time to talk about dementia and the great charity that the Alzheimer's charity and the work that they do but equally there are a few changes going on and obviously just as a reminder there are some uh, temporary changes with uh, Clinic Penel but that's all being very carefully looked after yeah. with the rehousing of people in that area but I, it's a really good point because obviously that is going to be our biggest challenge for the next few years is the rising uh, issue of dementia with our elderly population and it, it's something I'm looking for in a lot of detail in the care model because it's this is going to be a big issue for all of us <laughs> it's just it's all of us we're all affected by this yeah, yeah I've got to put my hand up here and say um, that as an island we should have a dementia strategy we really should be thinking forward about how we're going to deal with increasing numbers of of elderly people that are, are going through difficult times uh, and not only just those that have got dementia but the carers as well because th th they are key to ensuring that um, that people that d that do suffer from dementia um, have a quality have some quality uh, and we don't we don't do enough I don't think uh, at the moment and we need to do more to ensure that um, you know that, that our carers are looked after um, uh, I, I, you know I've, I've we both have engaged with Dementia Society and, and, you know, and, Sean, and Sean Ponton, and I know he's keen to ensure that, you know, that we we progress something in regards to a dementia strategy as soon as possible. We need to put that work in. COVID, you know, I'm not going to use that as an excuse, but but it has held up some of the work that we wanted to do around that. But um, making sure we've got enough provision on Ireland to, to make sure that people uh, can lead uh, dignified lives. Um, now, some of that, I think, could probably be done in our own homes moving forward, yeah. um, but you can only do that if you're going to. And, and, and some of the care models around that is providing that care in the community. But that's only going to work um, if the people that are caring get the support that they need, the respite they need, um, and the expertise that expertise they need to make sure that they can care for a loved one. It's not easy. Um, I've got some personal experience at the moment with a friend of. Uh, with, a, with a close friend that's, su that's suffering from dementia and, and, it's getting, and it's a horrible thing to go through and it's a horrible th thing to see somebody disappear in front of you um, but uh, we've got to support you know, we've got to provide that in investment moving yeah. forward and, and the other key missing element not to pile on but is the carer strategy because a, a fundamental big issue with anybody um, with dementia is the, the burden of responsibility that puts on to the to the loved one who becomes their carer, their full-time carer. Now, they're, they're not a professional carer, they're just caring for their loved one, their partner or their family member. And these things are starting to come to the forefront now because we're re-looking at how we go about business. And, and if we're going to, to nail these things, we have to be upfront and say, what are we doing for the mental and well-being of carers in all of us? If, if more carers are going to be put in the community going forward, which for all of us, we all want to make sure that we're more comfortable and getting the care in our home. How do we pay for that? But equally, how are we going to provide the care and the mental health well-being support for those people going through that journey? Because it, until you go through it, until you, it, you have somebody affected by mental health or a mental illness or dementia, you can't put it into words. And the effects then are still doubled if the support is not there for a carer. So those two things for going forward, and there's many lessons out of COVID, because obviously our immediate thoughts during the pandemic was we need to keep in contact with our um, elderly who are being shielded. So I know each parishes did their own thing and the government pulled some things together and we were all regularly checking in, but I think it made everybody tune in a bit 
uh, about this this issue, this growing issue. Um, that if we if we start putting ourselves more and more distance apart, the problems will grow bigger. So it's a big challenge for all of us, but one I think we're all going to be um, pushing on. Now I'm getting conscious we're getting to the end of our lot of time, and there's been some really detailed questions. So I think what we could say is some that we haven't answered in detail here. We will um, we'll pick off an answer and maybe type back. Maybe Steve can go back and, and get some more detailed answers from um, the department and others we could probably pick up ourselves. So just wanted to stress that um, because there are some really detailed questions and, and I think they need a detailed response that we could probably buffle our way through, but it's probably best to get some. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I know, I know we, we, that there are, there are a couple of questions beginning to uh, come on the screen around um, suicide, suicide prevention and some of the issues around suicide and uh, um, they are uh, difficult to answer uh, without some support from uh, some officers but we, we will get back to people on this. You know, one of the things I think we've got to put our hands up for uh, as an island is we don't have a, a suicide prevention framework. I know that's something that, that Andy, you've, you've been working for for a long period of time. Um, uh, I know it's stopped and started. Government's been committed to it and they're not committed to it. But uh, clearly it's, uh, it's an issue. It's an issue with uh, that has, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the wrong person when I talk to you, Andy, in regards to uh, how, how, how dramatic effect it has on, on a family. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to say too much more, but we do need to do some work on it and we do need to provide the support um, that I think we need to well, we put the effort into it to make sure that we can we can actually prevent more people even getting to the point that uh, they do take such a dramatic step. And I think also on, on that note, for, for me, we were very keen about this when we did our, our review, that it needed to be data and fact and evidence based, especially when talking about those areas. Um, because I found in the past, in my previous life, in broadcasting, sometimes um, reports would go out or information would come out. And you would then, it, it is not a subject you cannot be um, loose about with the figures. You need to be spot on and there's a way of going about it. Um, it can't be brushed aside and it cannot not be talked about. But there was a couple of times during the pandemic when people started going to that direction and I think um, many of us uh, in this world and led by Samaritans and others, we're, we're, we're stepping up saying, no, no, if you're going to claim something, you need to provide the evidence. There is a, in the actual process, there are delays and issues. Again, COVID has thrown us up about how things are, are statistically reported. And uh, that is something that's come out of this COVID process. So I think there are things that, but as Steve said, if we don't just sit around the table, wrap this into a strategy that's meaningful, but very delicately, but passionately done, we will be just going around the circle. So we, we just have to keep pursuing this. And, and that's the point of tonight. And I hope this video remaining out there will be held against me to hold against Steve and however that works. And maybe it's inspired other people to come forward. That's the, that's the plan of tonight. So um, just quick go through. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Some thank yous. Um, I saw one from Dave before about youth clubs. Don't underestimate youth clubs, uh, Dave. It's not everything that happens within the youth club. The youth service are brilliant at getting out in the community and getting out, meeting kids where they want to be uh, and trying to engage with those that sometimes are a little bit more difficult. They're great at that. Um, uh, and we do need to ensure that you know we carry on uh, the parishes and, and generally we carry on supporting and financing youth clubs. They've had a difficult time in the last few years um, and we need to make sure that they can they can survive. Yeah, and I guess if we're summing all, all, all of this up tonight is um, what have we learned this year is, I mean, everybody's a, a little bit, you know, we all go, oh, technology and it's running lives and there's pros and cons to technology. But what it has shown this year is how more connected we can be. Sometimes begrudgingly, we've all sat on a family Zoom night and uh, wish we were probably somewhere yeah. else. <laughs> so we've all been there. But now suddenly how much more connected we are. The, the big question will be is how over-reliant we will be. 
because we need to ensure, and this is something we were talking about earlier, that people, as much as it's great that we're doing this and we're indoors, but we should be outdoors. We, we can't lose the human connection. And it was something I and others raised during the early doors of the pandemic when we were, it was called, it was social distancing. And we were like, well, no, no, yes, the concept, but it's physical distancing. We cannot become any more social distant and especially there's no excuse on an island. But that means we have to be being sensible, following guidelines, following public health advice, being sensible, which I think we all are doing. But I think we also have to remember that for our well-being and mental health, we have to get out. We have to make sure that we're knocking on doors and using bikes and using our beaches and showing that, that in a sensible way. Because if we don't do that, we'll, we'll, the consequences will be worse. So this is great. This is great. This has to work in tandem. And we, as I guess, as ambassadors of that, we have to live by a word. We have to get out there. We have to be open and say, you know, yes, we have to be sensible. But there are many people depending on us now. And uh, people like, uh, you know, as Kevin's mentioned, the benches, the charities, we just have to keep getting out there and remembering where we are and how lucky we are to live on this island. I think the biggest... I suppose the biggest thing that I've, I've seen from everybody that's been involved with around mental health over the last, uh, certainly over the last six to nine months, is that everybody is really keen to work together. It doesn't matter whether it's government, whether it's the private sector, whether it's the charitable sector, uh, whether it's individuals, that there, there is such a, uh, an understanding that we're only going to make things better if we're prepared to all work together in the same direction. Um, Kevin's quite right. There are some times that you have to point the finger and you have to say that this is not right and this needs to be improved. But there are other times that we need to pat people on the back when things, things are going a little bit better and when things improve. And now that's not every day of the week. That might only be once or twice a year. But it, when, when things are going well and something has improved, I think we have to recognise that um, and, and not beat ourselves up um, and, and occasionally pat ourselves on the back and go, actually... That's a good piece of work, and we've improved. We've improved the environment for people that uh, are suffering from a mental health issue. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, if anybody thinks that, uh, I mean, I wouldn't hide. I wouldn't uh, even attempt to say that we've we've um, got where we need to be with uh, mental health services in the island. I think we're getting there. I think we need to have a, a, an understanding about how all the elements of mental health work for, from natal, perinatal, all the way through to, to adult and senior citizens and dementia, all the way through the whole pathway. We need to understand how that works and we need to make sure that as you transition through life, um, you're getting the right support. Um, and that's really important. Yeah. And it, it's, um, you know, and people talk about, you know, when many people said to me, what are you doing standing for being a politician? And I come back to, well, well I just want to make a difference. I'm not an expert. I don't have all the answers. I'm passionate about where I live and the island. I want to be a good role model and make a difference. But I can fundamentally point that the, the mental health uh, services of this island were not good enough. And I came in and as soon as I walked in and saw Orchard House with my own eyes for myself, I've never been more focused on doing something. And that you can take many choices. You can just stand up and moan about something for the sake of it. Or you can you can point to it and say where are the solutions and that that's what I'm hoping in, in the next years when I go back to the ballot when I go back to the voters and say here's what I saw here's what it did about it are we in a better place yes could we do more yes so when people say to me oh what's the point of standing as a politician I say well here you go and here the proof is it tonight if you'd said to us in the election that this would be happening that me and Steve would be sat here doing a, a, a hours Facebook chat about the subject of mental health would we have thought it would have happened? So things can happen. And hopefully tonight, by you watching this, somebody's watched this tonight and feels a little bit better and knows that you know we are talking about this as an island. And what more could we ask for? Apart from um, lots of extra money in the government plan. <laughs> yeah. I guess. Well, that's difficult. There's it is. Balance in the books. Should we do another hour on the... Uh... <laughs> balance in the books. <laughs> we could be all right. Where's the, where's the right to, place to commit government money yeah. at the right now? Uh, and mental health is one of those places. Absolutely. And uh, as long as uh, I'm there, and I know as long as Steve's there and there's others in the assembly, and hopefully in the next election, if you've been inspired to watch this, and this is a subject that is passionate for you because uh, we need more, as many people as possible, um, for the right reasons. And who knows? Um, but I hope 
and, and big thanks to Jenny and the Greth and the State's Assembly team uh, all doing. There's lots of things going on this week um, to promote all the work because um, a big part of this is to make people understand how this all works. I mean, a lot of people come into politics don't get it. Um, but this is the State's Assembly um, who holds the executive to account, which is in Jersey, the Council of Ministers. Steve's in that uh, government. I'm in scrutiny. And then obviously the third is the the judiciary who made the law. So, you know, anything we could do to promote that is great. And that, thank you for spending your time with us. Yeah, and I think the time to do this again will probably be after Christmas, um, when we've had an opportunity to see how things have progressed during the winter, and yeah. we can see where we are from a, uh, from a mental health view holistically through the service and, and, and see how we've all coped through, uh, hopefully, is, is a happy Christmas, but yeah. we just got to keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. I'm not going to wish people happy Christmas. <laughs> I was going to say, early. It was my, early. my birthday first. Um, so yeah, and, and, and final, most responsible thing is, if you are listening, there are people available. Uh, Mind Jersey, Samaritan's Jersey, yeah. uh, and all others. The listening lounge is open from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Just search on Facebook. Uh, there are people there waiting for you. And, um, um, and you know, take care of yourself. And um, there's not much left of 2020. But um, look how better we will all be because of it. Um, I fully believe that. So there we go. That's yeah. enough from us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Take care. Be good. Bye-bye. Well done. That was good. That was good. There were some interesting questions there. Sort of some, sort of most, quite a few expected, but there was a few. I mean, Andy did get in.